Yeah? Tremendous movement. What else strikes you about it? Foliage is a long way off. Man, the foliage is way out there, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Peter, where did this one come from? Originally, yeah, it was collected in France. Right? Objective bonsai design from the perspective of, as a proficient bonsai designer, right? We can't let emotion uh, overpower our ability to see through uh, individual characteristics that we become in love with, right? Oh, I love that gin. Oh, I love that art. Oh, right? We've got to see the best of what the tree has to offer, okay? So we're looking for the best base, right? That point of stability, the best trunk line, any special features that do add value to the tree, the origin of where the branches occur from that give us our potential to offer flow and direction and design, and then where the apex is gonna come from to complement that trunk line and those branches that we're using to generate that directional insinuation. So when you guys are looking at this, there should be something that sticks out about the base. It's, 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 it's very, uh, very linear, isn't it? Yeah? It occurs on one plane. So if I said, okay, let's choose this as a front and let's tip this up like this and create a beautiful bone side, we all should be thinking, how is, how is he planning on repotting that thing? Is he going to have some roots sticking straight up in the air? Right? We have some limitations design wise. Okay? And if we're trying to show the widest base or the the best visual stability with that base, it wouldn't make any sense to choose something from here or something from here as our front, right? Because we're actually decreasing the width of the base. We're decreasing the visual stability. So automatically, just in terms of practicality of repotability and in terms of visual stability, we're looking at our front from somewhere in here or somewhere in here as our potential options. Now, Serendipity prevails most of the time when we start pursuing objective bonsai design. It just so happens that we see the most changes in the direction and the best movement from either here or here. Okay? Ah, that's interesting how that works out for us. Okay? So if we've got good movement from here or here, we've got our, our most potential base from here or here. Now we've kind of been pulled into a decision. Do we want an upright tree? that potentially has a bit of this trunk hanging over the front of the container? Maybe something like this. Or, We want a cascading tree. Maybe something like this. Did you get it in the pot? Did you get it in the pot? I would assume you could get it in the pot. So, what if they're not good? I'm putting a lot of confidence in them. Okay, so I'm assuming, I'm assuming, just, just to stab in the dark, I'm assuming this thick root here probably is not a significant contributor to the finer root mass that is taking up moisture nutrition. Now we see this here. I'm also assuming that this is probably something we can work into the container. We'd be looking to have our container here and this probably sitting right on the front lip of our container when we, when we choose to repot it. Now we will have some contour here, some contour above that edge of the container, right in the root mass. That adds interest, we're okay with that. Okay. <coughs> Our focus, we don't want to have any straight lines here. Straight lines in terms of vertical or horizontal lines to the rim of the container. So if we have those, we need to fix that. I would say we're just past perpendicular right here. We might want to tweak a little bit more here. that you know we also have 
this back side that offers some potential as well. What do you guys think? No? No? You like the other side? You like the back side too? I think we're still better over here, yeah? Okay, so what do we do with all of these branches now? Cut them off. <laughs> make it make a short make a short day of it. <laughs> well, we're gonna have to cut some of them off. Which ones do we keep? Which ones contribute to the eventual shape of the tree? How do we make this decision? First of all, where's our where's our line? Base to tip. Okay, obviously through here we come up into here, right? Is this our line? <coughs> or is this our line? You like this one? You like this one? Okay. So I think this is our best transition of taper here, yeah? It also offers the most potential here. If that's the case, <coughs> what can this do for us in terms of the functional design? Not much, right? Makes it a little easier to see. What about uh, what about this guy? Anything? Okay. Now these could be valuable, yeah. Awfully long. But if we're talking about creating the most complete tree, this being our main branch providing movement here, that's uh, in a good position. We'll have to do some manipulation to get this where we want it to be, but that could potentially contribute. All right, and we come up here now. What about up in here? We're looking for something that allows us to create a compact design, correct? have some value. Does this have some value? This one? We could. We could create the whole tree out of this if we wanted to. Right? You've got a perfect apex here. You've got multiple branches to create. Will it bend up far enough? I don't know. I definitely see some potential in this branch. I also see potential in this branch because we've got this really nice in here. We've got some quality up here. We've also got something here. We've also got something here. That's a conundrum. The one at the back would probably twist around easier. This one? No, to the one there. No, this, one. Back. this one. This one. Right. This would come over for the apex quite mm -hmm. nice, wouldn't it? What's going to be our apex? What's going to be our uh, our primary branch? Okay, so when we start talking about when we start talking about bonsai design, right? So we basically eliminated things that don't immediately contribute or aren't a possibility of being used. Nothing that we really took off had any potential to create that tree from, right? We didn't think about what these were going to be yet. We were thinking about what these couldn't be. Okay, so now they're off. So now what we've got left, we've got to decide how are we going to use this to create a beautiful bonsai, right? Now, we've got several things to consider, but let's go back to just basic principles of deciding our design, okay? Three major elements that we've got to consider in the, in the design process. Number one is our trunk. Number two, where does our branch That defines the movement. Where does that branch come from? And number three, where does our apex come from? Okay, so we said, listen, we need to have, we need to find the line, the best line base to tip, right? And we decided that it wasn't gonna be here, 
that it was going to be here. So we've got to carry that same concept all the way through the design. Now, I think this offers a lot of potential here, a lot of flexibility to create an apex, absolutely, right? If we create the apex with this, then we could start to consider, well, does this, is this a problem here, right? Is that a problem? Yeah, maybe, maybe not. Right? This offers a tremendous opportunity to create a smaller secondary branch here, counterbalance branch perhaps. Is this going to be potentially usable for our primary branch or our branch that defines the movement? Hopefully, right? It's awfully long though, awfully long. If we can use it, we would choose to use it because it is in a, in a wonderful place, okay? I, I would say... It, it will make the tree more unique. The big question I have is can we use this, right? That's the big question I have. Can we use it? Now, the tree with the most value is gonna have the most branches, right? So as I'm sitting here creating deadwood and talking to you guys, I'm honestly sitting here in my mind thinking, how can I use this? How can we use this? Because we're trying to create a design centered around this tremendous movement in the trunk, right? Well. This is extremely far away from everything that's happening that we're trying to accomplish. Now, we can, we can bend and see if we can get it there, right? And if it works out, then this, this line, this movement in this branch is absolutely phenomenal. Do you disagree? That's a tremendous feature of the tree. But our foliage is here, yeah? How are we gonna bend and manipulate this to get the foliage here? And would you consider grafting as an alternative to shorten it? You could consider grafting, although I guess I would also ask, how would you go about grafting this? You know, because are you going to veneer graft where you actually pop a bud right in here? If so, your success rate is probably going to be fairly minimal. And that means one bud here is going to have to develop into an entire branch. You know, so that becomes problematic. And then you'd say, okay, well, what about approach grafting here? Oh, approach grafting on a pine, very, very difficult thing to do. It leaves a tremendous scar, no matter how good you are. And so your options become limited. If it were a juniper, it'd be no brainer, right? Just come in here with a whip or circle a whip around, approach graft, and in two years you could have an entire branch created from that. But on a Scots pine or, or something of this nature, that, that's way more difficult. The advantage is they're flexible, right? Well, is your first decision meant to see if that right hand branch is actually usable uh -huh. before you decide what you're going to do? I think so. I think that should be our kind of our starting point, don't you? Because yes. no way would we just cut this off and say, oh, it's not. That would be uh, that would be like throwing in the towel. If that offers potential for quality design, then we need to go for it. But I think we also need to go for it and push it. And if it doesn't work, know that we have tremendous options elsewhere in the tree, right? So I think that's gonna be our first move, is to see what we can do with this. Now, I'm assuming as we start to bend this, our design considerations for this tree are gonna change considerably. We'd be taking this one thicker of the two, where would it go? What would you do with it? Down? Well, we've got to reduce its length, right? Right. Are we still on the same page? It's got to go to the back. I'm going to say that in order to shorten this, I know that I've got to bring this structure down as far as I can, and I've got to bring this branch back and then forward, right? No other choice. There's nowhere else to take it. So all of this dictates how I'm going to wire this, right? 
because I know if I want to bring this down, number one, my wire's got to start here, okay? If I'm going to lower this structure, I've got to have a guy wire here. And I know that my turn, in terms of this being counterclockwise now, is going to limit what direction I can move that branch. So I've got to make sure that that's all going to work together to get that where it needs to be. So if I have any gaps or any spaces in this, my ability to bend is going to be significantly impeded, yeah? You guys work with Papa much? What was that? Well, why am I going this stiff? Serious torque on this thing. So we said we're going to push it, right? If it breaks, then we're, we can cut it off. <laughs> you can only do that two more times then. Yeah. <laughs> I got I got three. I got three. <laughs> Tanuki's looking good. Huh? Tanuki's looking good. Tanuki's looking good. <laughs> Let's say Tanuki's not an option. <laughs> farther down we can get this, the better off we're going to be. And we know that when we're bending climbs, our weak point is right here at this junction, yeah? Okay, that's where we've got to be for, uh, careful. So we're just going to continue to kind of keep an eye on that. Now, Scott's Pine are super soft and very flexible to a point. No. A squeaky <laughs> bum. I think it might be A squeaky bum moment. Oh, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, that'll be until we get the structure set, it's gonna be one continuous squeaky bum moment. <laughs> Mr. Kramura used to always say this is ninety percent of the work right here. <laughs> And the other 10% a monkey could do, <laughs> which felt quite demoralizing when you're one of his apprentices. <laughs> <laughs> start getting spooky, then it's really going to impact. <laughs>
That is not to say it won't snap. We might hear it might snap, right? But typically what you'll see is a tear. Raffia doesn't stop tearing, right? Raffia stops that, okay? So you want to be able to see as much as you possibly can that branch as it opens up so you know where the threshold is. Otherwise, you're just, you're working in the dark, right? Where we're at so far. Not too bad here, huh? Not bad at all. Interesting branch line. Okay, we'll see if we can pull it up. We'll suck it up a little bit more here, get it just a little bit tighter. That puts that right in a really interesting position, doesn't it? Yeah, with that terrific movement, really mimicking the trunk and that really tremendous movement there. Okay, now this one, right, equally as long as this one, and we're saying, okay, how are we going to use that well? All right, we have a, an entire space here that we really need to kind of close the gap between this branch and what's going to come above it. So we're going to bring this up as opposed to down. There's no room down for it. Okay, so if it's going to be used, and we may get it up here and we may say, you know what, it just isn't meant to be. Let's go ahead and get rid of it. But we could bring it up and say, man, that is going to lay in here and create this whole secondary pad or, or profile up here that really blends the two branches and the upper apical area together.
look at the moment when you set the structure for the first time, they look kind of like an octopus, you know? Uh, I'm assuming when we start to set these branches in the position they need to be in, or uh, set the finer branches into their pads and stuff, all of these kind of convoluted lines are gonna have some clarity come about them, right? Uh, but we've gotta wait a little bit before we get to see that. Now, let's move to the top section, okay? What are we gonna do with the rest of this now? What happens here, what happens here, what happens here? Is this our most likely candidate for an apex? Mm -hmm. No? Middle one. This one's our most likely candidate, you think? This is going to be a back branch? Yeah. And what's this one going to be? Not sure yet. Not sure, not sure yet. Branch is the long Yeah, I know. I feel that so this could be that counter to that, yeah? yeah. Is it safe to assume that we don't need this? We okay here? Yeah. All right. Let's set this one next down. then there's a counterbalance here to this over here. So then, now we're up into this area here. What happens now? <laughs> this one's too far up. This one. Or this comes into here. Do we have room for both to be used is the question. Not really, right? Not with this size of trunk. We can't support both of these being used. So which one are we going to use? This one. This one. And where do we want it to go again? Right here? Okay. The other one, you've got to change and she could be where you want to put it. This one? Yeah. yeah, that one would be easier, I think. I think it would. Alright, well let's try this one, and if it breaks, we'll use this one. <laughs> that's called option. That's, a, that's yeah. not called option. That's called, pat, that's called padding your approach, right? <laughs> I'm still not totally convinced on this one. Uh, but for now, we'll leave it. There's no way we could use this as a counter here. It's just so wide, and we pushed it about as far as it can go. We pushed it about as far as it can go. We may be able to get a little bit more flex here to drop it in, but we really want to hug that in here as close as possible. We want that virtually up against this portion here, because the last thing that we want to do is create a tree that has equidistance on both sides of the trunk. We need to pull this in and elongate that, right? So this is here. That's clearly our branch that defines our movement to the right. Yeah, this one being here is still too far out. So we'll give it a little bit of breathing room, we'll do some work, we'll try to get this one set. The goal is to have this done in the next half hour so that when we hit lunch, the structure is done, okay? beginning of September, and there is this really significant reason for doing that. Uh, on Japanese white pine, when you repot a Japanese white pine, you're never going to get a very good production of buds the year that you repot. And so they would let them, uh, you know, produce that good set, of, that good flush of growth, and then come back in the late summer after it had hardened off, and right before it, it went into active fall growth, because you have summer dormancy in the heat in Japan. Uh, right before it went into that really active period of growth in the fall, repot it, and then it focuses its energy on replenishing the root system and regenerating the root system. Now, I would never, I would never encourage, I would never encourage somebody to do that unless you were absolutely certain of 
timing and your environment. Um, even in the United States, I still have yet to take the plunge. And, and here's the other thing. Why, why is the spring so good for repotting? Why do, why do we tend to repot in the spring? Okay, so they're coming out of dormancy. So we're saying, listen, they're also coming out of dormancy in the late summer, early fall, right? They're coming out of summer dormancy. So why why is the spring better? They're coming out of summer dormancy. Because in the fall, you go into the dormancy period. Okay, definitely, definitely. What else? Temperature. 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 Well, temperature. Temperature. Environmental conditions, right? So when you think about, okay, repotting in the spring, if we're just saying, listen, post-dormancy or just before the break of dormancy is an ideal time to repot, well, you have a dormancy, you have two dormancies a year. You have one in summer and you have one in winter, okay? And so we say, okay, well, post-summer dormancy could be a good time to repot trees. Yeah, maybe, maybe, but look at the environmental conditions that you're dealing with in conjunction with a reduction of the portion of the tree that supplies the rest of it with the moisture it needs to survive, right? So you have environmental conditions that are not favorable for repotting. If you choose to repot in late summer, right, you have to provide extensive amounts of aftercare to allow those trees to recover from that operation. So I would say, going back to the very base question, when is the best time to repot pines? I still think the best time to repot pines is in the spring, right when you see the buds starting to take on color uh, as water rises. You know, for a Scots pine, that means it turns from that real mauve color uh, to a more caramel color. You know, and the ponderosa pines take on a real white color in their uh, needle mass when they're about ready. Black pines start to take on some brown, and they go from white to that caramel color, and you see the striations or the striping in the candle. That's the ideal time to repot a pine. But you guys may say, well, but we have great success in the, in the summertime on our pines. And if that's the case, I would say, well, then don't stop. Powerful, right? It's, it's a little bit, it's not, not ultra masculine from that perspective. It is fairly strong, but not not completely uh, blowing you out of the water strong. It has some feminine characteristics, mainly the sinuous movement, right? So when you say masculine, you'd be talking about thick, powerful, and angular, correct? That's what matches well with a rectangular container. And this is not angular, this has very sinuous movement. So then you would say, okay, well then what do you consider it feminine? But this is not a feminine tree, is it? Not feminine in any way, shape, or form. So this wouldn't sit well in an oval, would it? No. Ovular container being the most feminine of containers. So I would say this could sit in a rectangular container that had some rounded corners, or maybe even a cut corner, right, where you have a strong impression in the corner. It could sit very well in one of those not going to sit well in an oval. When would you put a tree into a taiko or a drum pot? When is that a good container decision? A literati? Huh? Literati? I did not show the word bronzes. <laughs> when, you're, when you're undecided. <laughs> I, knew that was, I knew that one was coming. Now seriously though, you know, just, just like we said, hey listen, when we designed bonsai to say, oh, if I was artistically inspired to choose this container, okay, that's, that's not, come on now. You have to have more of a foundation of knowledge than I was compelled to do so. Okay? Why do we choose the containers that we choose? This is a huge uh, misunderstood aspect of bonsai. Each container has its purpose and its function, okay? And even if we want to deviate from that, we have total freedom to deviate from that. Just the same as we have the freedom 
to pursue bonsai uh, in a European way or an American way. But if you're going to deviate from the model, right? If you're going to deviate from what's been tried and tested. I mean, you think about how long they've been doing bonsai in Japan. They probably tried some things and had them not work, and that's why they landed on what has become standard and custom today, right? So if you're going to deviate, you've got to understand what you're deviating from and why you're deviating. Say a drum container is used for a tree that has a tremendous amount of visual weight moving off of the lateral boundary of the container. Does that make sense? Yep. Moving off of the lateral boundary of the container. Why does it make sense to use a drum pot for a tree moving off of the lateral boundary of the container? Can you expand a bit on moving off the lateral boundary of the container? Yeah. <coughs> where, where is the lateral boundary of the container? The wall of the container, right? So that's saying that the visual weight of the tree, mainly the apical portion, is going to be moving off of the, away from the edge of the container. Okay, breaking that lateral boundary. Balancing the, balancing the drop. So the container is providing that visual stability because you've got the majority of the visual weight off of the edge of the container, right? Not just off of center, but off of the edge of the container. Well, a drum pot, most of the time has the same circumference on the lip as it does on the foot, right? And it has a very straight wall most of the time, okay? And they tend to be quite squat or a low center of gravity. That's the ultimate visual stability. This tree, if you gave this tree a container that had this maximized visual stability, you're gonna be creating such a clunky container combination for a tree that has some sinuous elegance, right? We can do better than that. I think that the rectangular shape with the rounded corners to pick up on some of the feminine aspects of the, of the tree itself is probably going to be our best option on this guy. And it needs to be all side pop. It needs to be what? An oxide pot. An oxide pot. Yeah. What's an oxide pot? The color. The finish. Needs to be oxide. What about just unglazed? Well, that is. Is that an oxide pot? Is it David? Yes. David makes the best one. <laughs> he does make. He does. He does make a damn good pot. <laughs> His oxides are like a red and black. Yeah. yeah they're very nice. They're good pots. Yeah. Oh, he's got uh, three or four pots back there for me. So there's a big difference between an oxide wash, right? Or an oxide application and an unglazed container. Not to say oxide is glazed, because it's not. Glaze causes vitrification, which would be like uh, almost creating a glassy right covering to the container which has a big impact on the way a tree grows in a vitrified container what happens if we do away with this branch seems more moving well and right so we've got this very kind of round silhouette as opposed to having something that comes here and out this kind of rounds out that silhouette I'm tempted, tempted to take it off, but if I take it off based on the foliage mass we've already removed and where this tree could potentially progress to in the future, right now it's better to leave this as opposed to make that decision, okay? This foliage mass will feed the development of the rest of the tree. It's, in terms of a pine, this feeds this, feeds this, feeds this, okay? Because they're all, they're all feeding the root system that's indiscriminately pushing that energy into the rest of the foliage mass. All right, so we'll leave it, but just know that this is definitely one of the areas that we're still considering as a potential removal, okay? As far as the apex is concerned, this side of the apex is fairly sparse and scant. We probably want to compress this a little bit more, so our apex came up, came back in, and then out, in, and then out, all right? So we're gonna let this expand foliage mass-wise, see what happens over the course of the next year. 
but most definitely the structure has been set, right? The primary structure is definitively in the position that we want it to be moving forward, and that was the goal of today, okay? Any questions? Any more questions? Yeah? There's an original gin uh, on the front of the front end. Are you going to keep that? This thing? Yeah. Because from where I'm looking at, that's creating a donut effect. Oh, is it? Uh, and I find that disturbing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, that was your favorite gin, wasn't it? Yeah. It's half price now. Yeah, you can have it for four grand. Ah, it's interesting. <laughs> this branch is an interesting feature, though. It's it has some potential. Yeah. I'm definitely I'm happy that yeah. we used this. Yeah. That was the yeah. choice. That was a good choice. Yeah. 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 Hmm. Anyways, this is a good first step. Yeah. Okay. Thank you guys so much. I appreciate it.